Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our gospel this morning comes once again from the book of Mark and I believe is because of my military background that I am drawn to this gospel. You see, Mark is a writer of fewer words. He comes directly to the point and then he quickly moves on. He puts the life and the ministry of Jesus on a fast track and one of the most used words in Mark to move us from one scene in Jesus' life to another is the word immediately. In Mark's first 20 verses of this, his first chapter, Jesus meets John the Baptist. He is baptized. John announces and shouts to the crowd that Jesus is the one. He is the Messiah. Immediately then, the scene changes where Jesus is in the wilderness a place of discernment and reflection where he gains a fuller understanding that his kingdom is not of this world. In the next verses, as we heard last week, Jesus begins his selection of his closest companions, his disciples. Straight away then in verse 21, we come to today's story. And I don't believe that it is just a random event that Mark, the writer, selects this event to be the first recorded one in Jesus' ministry as Jesus encounters this man possessed by an unclean spirit, often called a demon in other parts of Mark. Because you see, this story is not just about getting rid of a demon. It is about authority. It is about the power of Jesus. It is about God's power and authority over the evil and the demons in this world. This story may seem a bit bizarre to us, but we enter the scene and Jesus is teaching in the synagogue and it is apparent that his teaching must have some authority and some tremendous power because we are told all are astounded at his teaching for he taught them as one having authority. And while everyone there seems to be riveted to Jesus' words and the People may be on the edge of their seats or maybe on the edge of their prayer rugs. There comes this cry, better translated, a tortured scream from a man who we are told is possessed by this unclean spirit, this demon. What have you to do with us, Jesus, he says? Have you come to destroy us? I know you are the Holy One of God. And quickly Jesus responds and at at his word, this unclean spirit, this demon is removed from the man and everyone around him is amazed. The people in the synagogue, I expect, came thinking there's going to be some kind of a routine service and now have found themselves in this confrontation between good and evil, between clean and unclean, between Jesus and this demon. And there's always great speculation about what this demon might have been or what this unclean spirit might have been in this man on this day in the synagogue. And scholars and historians have suggested that people with something like epilepsy or other mental diseases were considered to be possessed by evil spirits. And belief in demons was widespread in Judaism as the source of evil. But whatever the cause, this man's condition made him unwelcome in his own community of faith. But I think we lose sight of what this story is really telling us if we spend our time trying to personify or picture in our mind what this evil spirit or demon is, because this is a story about authority, a story about the power of Christ to overcome evil and brokenness, a story of awe and amazement, a story of restoration. At the very beginning of this gospel, Mark, the writer, wants us to understand that the authority of God rests in this Jesus and that with the demon removed, this man is now restored and could be a member of this community of faith. As Pastor Craig just mentioned, this is a special day for me, both as a pastor and as a grandfather. At our late service, I will be baptizing my fourth grandchild and my first grandson, Asher Thomas Scarberry, welcoming him into this community of faith. 
Many infants and young children and adults have been baptized here at Abiding Christ over these years. But I am not sure that how often we all fully recognize with awe and amazement just what happens here as we honor Jesus' authority and his command to baptize all people. Perhaps particularly in the case of infants, we are sometimes more enamored with the sight of a cute baby. Is he or she going to cry or not going to cry? We look at this blessed gift and miracle of new life that maybe sometimes we can miss what this sacrament truly offers. Because in the water and the word, the demons of a fallen humanity and sin and death are overwhelmed by the grace and the forgiveness of a loving God, the seed of faith planted, and a new baptized son or daughter is welcomed into a caring and loving community of faith with an eternal promise to be with Christ and God. And that the authority of Jesus is, re is replete in those words that we say, child of God, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. A promise, you see, that's been made to you and me and to all baptized Christians. But you know, while we may celebrate a new baptized life in Christ, we also know that the power of baptism does not immune you and me from the demons of sin and evil that we find in this world that pursue us in our journeys in life and continue after our baptism. And they, as scriptures tell us, are often like a roaring lion seeking to devour. A number of years ago, I saw the following advertisement on the webpage of something called deliverancenow.com. It read, are you a Christian vexed with mental, emotional, behavioral problems? despite all your spiritual pursuits and best efforts at overcoming them? Are you sometimes overcome with such things as anger and rage and hatred and bitterness and resentment? And the list went on and on and on. Are you bound and controlled by compulsions, addictions, obsessions, or perversions in your life? Do you find yourself repeating cycles of behaviors or circumstances that troubled your own ancestors or relatives? Or finally, it said, are you sick and tired of living the way you have been living? And if the answer to any of these questions is yes, it is highly likely you see that demonic powers are the real source behind these outward manifestations and that the only real solution is for them to be cast out of your life through the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit Moreover, it is highly unlikely you will ever experience real freedom apart from this deliverance. Our phone rate is $50 per half hour session. <laughs> All major credit cards accepted. Si habla espanol. <laughs> now perhaps this website might sound a little comical if the subject that it deals with were not so serious. I looked over this list of problems that was spelled out on this website and I thought, well, hasn't anyone, hasn't everyone had one or more of these problems sometimes or perhaps often in their life? And according then to this, we are all possessed by demons and for only $50 per half hour, the Holy Spirit can be called upon to remove them from us. How convenient, how capitalistic the solution to the problems of the demons of sin and evil in our lives. But you see, today's words of Mark tell us something very different. Perhaps this story may seem by many to be out of place in this modern world. You see, demon possession is the stuff of grade C horror movies, and some see demons as fallen angels, and the devil is some sort of lead fallen angel or funny creature with horns and tail outfitted in red tights, pitchfork in hand. And however you and I might visualize the reality of demons and evil spirits, we know and make no mistake that sin and evil is real in our day and in our world just as it was in Jesus' time. And there are demons and evil spirits that infiltrate our lives that seek to take root and can overwhelm us. 
In the website ad that I just shared with you, there is not one of us that has not found some of those demons either at our doorstep or in the process of taking over our hearts and minds. The reality of the demons in our lives is that they are insidious. They lull us with their charm and their appeal to all that makes us a broken humanity. Evil, you see, will not rest and will not leave us alone. Now, I'm not much of a gardener, but I do know how weeds seem to find a way to grow no matter what. And just about the time you think you have gotten rid of all of them, they will reappear often with greater vigor. And if not attended to, they will take over. And the same is true for the evil and the demons that come into our lives. If they're ignored or remain unattended, they can take over. And about the time we think maybe we have taken care of our personal demons and have them under control, they will sprout up again. Notice that in our gospel that the possessed man knew who Jesus was. The evil and the demon that possessed him did not keep him from knowing this Holy One of God, but it kept him from living in the love and the grace that Jesus had to offer. And that is what demons do to you and to me. They keep us from lives filled with love and grace and peace and hope. And instead, we find ourselves, as Paul told us, that we know there are things we ought to do and cannot do and vice versa. Demons can torture our minds and our hearts, turning us away from a loving God, from loving each other, and even from knowing and loving ourselves as people created in God's image. I asked today, what are the demons in your life? Perhaps they are just nuisances. Maybe they have grown into activities and actions and thoughts that are disruptive. Or maybe they have taken over your life and become disabling and debilitating. You see, our demons can range from little materialisms, little temper tantrums and jealousies and family conflicts to severe addictions. And whatever they might be in your life and mine, they hanker after us. They come at us again and again and again because you see those demons and their attacks will never cease. God created you and me with fertile soil in our hearts and minds and that soil will either feed good plantings or evil weeds. What do you find growing in your heart and your soul? There have been times in my life, and I assume there are times in yours, that I suspect it would have been a wonderful thing to have Jesus come and say, as he did to this tortured soul in the gospel, that to find something with me, in me and say, demon, come out. And while you and I might not experience this story in Mark's gospel, in quite the same way, Jesus offers us his life and his death and his resurrection and in it that same peace and freedom that he gave to this man in the synagogue. And just like that man in the gospel, Jesus knows because he was on this earth and he knows the demons and the evil and the sin that make war on you and me. That free gift of grace that we have received in baptism in faith can surround and envelop and drown the demons that continue to find their way into our lives. And certainly there are times when professional help and counseling and medical treatments are necessary. But if we daily celebrate and recall our baptism, as Luther said, we must. We are enabled to admit the demons in our lives and that they are having their way. And that that promised power of our baptism and the authority of Jesus can give us the power to overcome them because it has been shown again and again and again that counseling and support programs are most effective when the hearts and minds of those participating are captivated by the love and the grace of God. The power and authority of the living Christ is there to subdue our demons if evil only let him. It should not pass our attention that Jesus was teaching in the synagogue when he healed this man possessed because you see, it's by listening and heeding the teachings of Jesus that we can best unleash God's power within us. For you and for me, that happens when we develop a vital prayer life. 
when we frequently study God's word, not just on Sunday mornings, when we participate regularly in worship and in the sacraments, because in those ways we feed and we nourish our hearts and crowd out and destroy those demons that are always lurking about. And in it all, you and I can know and can be certain that in Christ, we are assured of final victory. In closing, there is an old American Indian tale that recounts the story of a chief who was telling a gathering of young braves about the struggle within. He said, it is two dogs fighting inside of us, the chief said. There is one good dog who wants to do the right and the other dog wanting to do the wrong. Sometimes the good dog seems stronger and is winning the fight, but sometimes the bad dog seems stronger and wrong is winning the fight. Who is gonna win in the end? A young brave asked. The one you feed, the chief answered. The solution to the demons in our lives will not be found on the webpage and the $50 per half hour cha charges of deliverancenow.com. Rather, on this day, let you and I feed our hearts and our souls by immersing ourselves in God's word, filling ourselves with the grace received at the table of the Lord, and knowing that the one having authority in our lives may drown out the demons because we will daily renew our baptism, worshiping and praying that the power of the Spirit would grant the nearness of Christ to each of us as we encounter and battle the evil and the sin that confronts us. God grant it for Jesus' sake. Amen.